On July 5, 1983, the Nintendo Family Computer Gaming System, or Famicom, was released to Japanese audiences. It was a hit and would be released in North America as a Nintendo Entertainment System on October 18, 1985. Just a few months later, the Famicom Disk System was released exclusively in Japan on February 21, 1986. The system played the same style of Famicom games, but using a cheaper to produce floppy disk format, and with some added features such as save states and enhanced sound and music capabilities. With lifetime sales of over 4.4 million units, the disc system wasn't considered a runaway success, but its impact on the industry shouldn't be understated. However, due to the cost of cartridges becoming cheaper and cheaper shortly after its initial release, official support for the system came to a stop in 1990. The Twin Famicom is an interesting console. It's one that immediately caught my attention as a collector who wants things to be as simple as possible while still owning the original hardware. After doing some research, I realized that this system was probably the best way for someone like me to get into playing Famicom disc system games. What the Twin Famicom is, is literally a Famicom and a Famicom disc system shoved into one convenient box. But it's got a lot more of a story to tell from there. It was manufactured by Sharp and came in a variety of different models and colors. Some were shaped like a VCR, others came in a curvier design. Some were black and red, some were red and black, some were black with green and blue trim. New Life Shark. The Twin Famicom was licensed by Nintendo, but they did their best job to make sure that Nintendo's name appears almost nowhere on this thing. At least not that I can find. They did, however, decide that they were going to have their own unique Famicom logo, even though it's basically the same thing, just with a little dot in the middle of the O. But removing Nintendo's name didn't change that it played Nintendo games, which at the time were only on the disc system, including Super Mario Bros. 2 and The Legend of Zelda. It may have looked different on the outside, but on the inside, it was still a Nintendo. Released just six months after the disc system in July of 1986, the twin Famicom features a Ryko 2A03 processor, 2 kilobytes of work RAM, 2 kilobytes of video RAM, and 32 kilobytes of work RAM and 8 kilobytes of video RAM in Famicom Disk System mode. Audio features six voices, two pulse wave channels, one triangle channel, one noise channel, one PCM channel, and one 6-bit wavetable channel. It also features graphics supported by a Ryko 2C02 at 256 by 240 pixels, up to 64 sprites, and can display 25 colors at a time out of a total of 53 available. But what does all of that mean? I don't know, I just know I can play my 8-bit games. I got this thing because the NES is my all-time favorite video game console. I love that I can start it up, jump into a game, and immediately start having fun. Even if the games are short, old, pretty hard, by today's standards. They're always fun. I could go on about the NES, but I'm saving that for a future video. Still, I have a deep history with the NES, and I figured that it was time for me to start jumping into imports. You know, explore games that never made it over to North America. Or even just to collect the cute little cartridges that Japan got. There's a lot to dive into with the Twin Famicom, and I can't wait to get my hands on more of it. Just look at these games, way better than the cartridges we have in America. The housing is colorful, the artwork is, in my opinion, much nicer, and they take up less space. I watched videos on YouTube compiling all of the games available for the Famicom and had a list of games I wanted to play that was way longer than I thought it would be at the end. We got a good chunk of the Famicom library on the NES, but there's still plenty of games that we didn't get that are perfectly friendly to English readers. It's worth looking into, especially if you think you've played all the 8-bit games out there, but you still want more. And that's just the Famicom. The disc system offers even more unique experiences. These disc writing stations were only in Japan and would put a new game on your disc for a fraction of the cost of buying a brand new disc with the game already installed. Just insert your disc, pick the game you want, and the machine does the rest. 
You could even get new labels for the disc in the shop to slap onto your disc and keep everything uniform. The Nintendo imprint on the bottom of the disc is actually a way to prevent piracy, but that didn't work for very long. <laughs> These games are just so cool. They're Nintendo games on a floppy disk. They come with this cute little manual. It's such a quirky piece of technology. It's like a CD, but with VHS tape on it, and it has interactive software. It's just so charming to me. They have these little sleeves for the disc to slide into. It's just a collector's dream or a nightmare if you're a person who collects only complete in-box things, which I wasn't until I saw these cute little discs, and now my wallet's fucked. Still, none of what I've said means that the twin Famicom is perfect. It has a lot of the same issues that the original Famicom did. The controllers are hardwired into the back of the system and this cable can't be more than three feet long. It's also prone to the same dysfunction that the original disc system was with the belt inside that controls the disc mechanism actually rotting. Of course, you also have to deal with the pins in the cartridge slot becoming loose over time, which can make getting cartridge games to work a pain too. But these are pains that retro gamers know and frankly, might even find charming. There's also always the option to buy a controller and put your own in, solving the short cord issue. And the system does have built-in AV out, so you're getting a much better signal output than you would with a regular RF that you got on the original Famicom. So while it does suffer from the same drawbacks of the original Famicom and this system, it's just more convenient, less cables and things to plug in, and it looks just ever so slightly more modern. Overall, I think the Twin Famicom is the best option if you're looking to get into the Famicom. It's a two-in-one console, it looks very cool, and it isn't even that expensive. You can play all of the Famicom and Famicom Disk System games you want on it, and that's an impressive library. I'd highly suggest getting a Twin Famicom if you were a kid who grew up with the NES in your home. It immediately transported me back into memories of sitting in front of a CRT television at a friend's house, playing their library of games, and discovering new experiences through those visits. If you're a fan of 8-bit games, you owe it to yourself to look into this system and its library. We missed out on some seriously high-quality games, and this is, in my opinion, the best way to experience them authentically. I just find this thing so charming and fun. Whether it's games I've played before on my NES, or games that I'm experiencing for the first time, I really feel like I'm holding a piece of history every time I pick this thing up and hold one of the controllers. And really, that's what this whole thing is about. Sharing my love of our history as gamers with as many people as I can. If you have something you'd like me to discuss in the future, let me know. I hope you enjoyed learning about the Twin Famicom as much as I did, and I'll see you next time. Well, I won't see you, but you'll see me.